All righty then. Well, hello everyone. How's everybody doing? Um, I realize you can't respond, so it's silly to ask questions. Um, one thing I do regret is knowing who everyone is. How many of you are students? How many of you are professionals? How many of you are ETC people um, looking to waste some time this afternoon? Um, but regardless, I'm glad everybody showed up. I'm here with Matt Stoner. Um, Matt, why don't you jump in and say hello and tell folks who you are. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Matt Stoner. I am the product manager for automated lighting at uh, ETC High End Systems. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, working with your questions and uh, assisting Tom with this presentation. So just to get started, um, I dropped out of graduate school to go do one or two rock and roll tours. I, I went to work for a company in Dallas, Texas called Shoco. And Shoco uh, was one of the first companies in the US that started catering to the rock and roll touring in, in, um, industry. Rock and roll bands started touring. Uh, they realized very quickly they needed better PA systems and better lighting systems. Um, and several companies were formed uh, in the United States, in Europe, in the UK, to cater to those companies. And Shoco was one of those companies. Um, I was in graduate school. I was bored. Uh, my college roommate had a cousin who worked for this strange rock and roll company called Shoco, and I dropped out of school for one semester to do um, to do a few tours, see what that was like, and then my plan was to go back to graduate school. Um, and I looked something like this in the photo. So the the neat thing about that, the neat thing about Shoco was that they were um, they did big tours. They were one of the pioneers. They did Wings Over America. They did Led Zeppelin. They did The Who. So I was incredibly fortunate that uh, in the in the 1970s, I was able to go out and do these tours. Um, and so what happened next, he said. So then as I was getting ready to um, to go back to graduate school, they started telling me about this project they had um to to create this 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 color changing fixture and at this point in time those of you who have discussed this when uh when lighting people get together in hotel bars and drink and start talking about the history of of lighting you will probably hear you may have heard something along the lines of yeah very light invented all this stuff very light invented the moving light um and you need to know that that's not correct very light did not invent the moving light um, they, but what they did do was put a lot of stuff together. Um, here's a neat photo that I always start out with, with a neat drawing. And if you've had any kind of theater history, um, theater history textbooks, you will have seen some version of this. Um, and the reason I throw this out is that even before people knew about electricity, they were looking for mechanical, um, mechanical ways to solve lighting problems. Um, We've got candles lighting our stage. We need to make them dimmer. We're going to rig this thing up. We're going to rig these cans up, and we're going to be able to lower these cans over the light, over the candles, and make these things work. So, in other words, even before there was electricity, people were working on this stuff. They were working on ways to make um, to do things mechanically with lighting. This is a patent. A U.S. patent drawing. If you'll notice, it's from 1928, so long before there was very light or anybody else or rock and roll tours. Um, there were people looking again for mechanical solutions. Um, I love this thing. I love this drawing. You've got a. If you look really close up in here, you've got a commutator. Uh, you've got a gear drive doing pan. You've got this great chain drive doing tilt. Um, this is neat stuff. In 1928, here was this guy creating this patent to make this moving light. Um, in Europe in the 1950s, uh, companies like uh, Pani and Needhammer were building moving lighting systems. Um, the, the, one of the interesting things about Europe is that there is generally and has always been government money for the arts. Um, so uh, European opera houses, uh, European state theaters, 
Um, generally, it did some really interesting things because they had funds. Um, they, were, they were doing some really incredible stuff. Um, you can see these lights. There's a 15 light controller there in front, if you can read your German. Um, so the folks in, from Pani and all these other companies were doing some really interesting things. And we're only in the 1950s. Um, if you go further and you really start delving into this, one of the names that you have to deal with is George Eisenhower. Uh, George, George Eisenhower was a well-known um, theater consultant. He designed theaters. Um, he was a, a, a hardcore guy. He was very opinionated. Uh, people generally loved him or hated him. Um, but he worked with his students. And they built moving lights. He thought, what a great thing. If we can make these lights pan and tilt, we can get a lot more use out of them. So he worked with his students. They cobbled stuff together. They made these really, really interesting um, fixtures. And now we're talking about the 1950s. One of the greatest things about George Eisenhower, though, is um, he he was thinking about the lights. He was always working out ways to control them. Um, one of the problems was the control systems of these things were gigantic. Um, one, two, or three lights re required a, a, a supporting hardware uh, system here that was the size of a small refrigerator. So this was not convenient stuff. It was a great idea, <clears throat> excuse me, but it just wasn't practical. And here's the most interesting thing about Eisenhower. Um, we saw the first light, which was a pan and tilting light. Not only did he think about that, he actually created a mirror light, a moving mirror light. Now, this, this wonderful little device was built to be a remote control follow spot uh, to be used in a smaller theater space at Yale. Um, so you've got this really hot light source uh, in this small little metal box underneath the very low ceiling of a small theater. Um, so it got way too hot. So one of the interesting things about this fixture was it actually had liquid cooling. Uh, you had to run, run water to it. Um, again, the ideas were there, but the technology just couldn't quite hold up. Uh, the idea of one light uh, with a water hose attached to it is kind of scary. The idea of 30 or 40 lights uh, for a larger system. Obviously, kids, that ain't happening. So. While Eisenhower had all these great ideas, the technology just hadn't caught up with him. Um, here's another, this is uh, the ADB company. This is yet again a, a, a studio lighting company. Once again, the folks in Europe moving along here. This was not a lighting system. This was an individual, um, an individual fixture with its own little uh, dangling controller there, a dongle type controller. Um, so, once again, people working on mechanical solutions to make lights move around. I love this photo, um, this, this drawing. It's a patent drawing from 1965. Um, again, it's got a chain drive. It's got a motor in the base to, to pan it. Um, so this is great stuff. And the greatest thing about this is if you, have, if you know your Broadway lighting history, if you know your lighting folks, um, the person that invented this, that applied for this patent, was Jules Fisher. So, once again, somebody wanted to do moving lights. Somebody saw what a great idea it would be if we could put all of this stuff together. Um, if we could just somehow make these things move around, this would be a good thing. Uh, and Jules Fisher, not only was he a great lighting designer, is a great lighting designer, um, but he had these ideas. He was trying to put this stuff together to make lights move. So now we've got to shift gears a little bit and get into the rock and roll, um, the, the rock and roll world. In the 1970s, um, rock and roll bands started touring in the 50s and 60s. And by the 1970s, they were touring in earnest. We weren't talking about little bands playing in little clubs. We're talking about big bands playing in um, hockey rinks, sporting arenas, large theaters. Um, 
And the companies, like I said earlier, companies like Shoko were developed to create the lighting systems and the sound systems to um, start catering to that business. Um, Led Zeppelin is coming to your town. They need a really loud sound system. Um, initially, they would rent whatever was available locally. And before long, they realized if we're going to have good, consistent sound quality, we need to rent a sound system and carry it with us for the entire tour. Um, the same thing happened in lighting. Um, if we pick up whatever we happen to have in, in any individual city, there's no way to know what we're going to get. So if we, need to, uh, we need to be able to carry our own lighting and sound systems. So companies like Shoko developed uh, were uh, evolved um, and people were very entrepreneurial and they built these lighting systems and sound systems. Um, so we're talking about the 1970s and this started moving really, really quickly. Here's Led Zeppelin on stage. We're in about 1973. Um, there's not even a drum riser. The drums are sitting on the stage. We, we've got lights um, on floor stands. We've got roadies sitting around the edge of the stage. This was a rock and roll tour at that time. And we're talking about, again, the early 1970s. By the middle of the 70s, in just a few short years, we started getting pretty sophisticated. Um, we weren't just floor supporting things with lifts. Uh, we had chain motors, we had riggers, we were building trusses on the ground, um, pushing our, our, our remote control button and lifting these things up in the air. Um, we had what would still be recognizable today as a small or medium sized um, lighting system. Um, I mean, if you were to look at that today, it might look okay. It would be a very small system, it was maybe 100 or 150 lights. So we're now in the middle of the 1970s. This is the end of the 1970s. This is Van Halen. Um, we're talking about a thousand park hands. Um, what happened? Well, I always call it the testosterone factor. Um, my tour had to be bigger than your tour. My next tour had to be bigger than my last tour. And so by 1979 or so, you had bands like Van Halen touring again with 1,000 park hands. Um, you had a team of five or six people that crawled up on that rig every afternoon and individually focused each and every one of those fixtures. Um, so what happened then was we were getting to the, the limits of what a building could support. You went into a hockey rink, you went into a sporting venue, a basketball arena, and there was a limit to how much weight you could hang from the ceiling. And you were starting to get really close to that limit. How much stuff can we hang up there and still be safe? Um, and at Shoko at that time, um, they were realizing that they had pretty much hit the wall. They had older park end systems. They had steel park end systems. They had heavy wiring. Um, there were English lighting companies. Um, folks in the UK had developed aluminum park ends and lighter weight wirings and uh, lighter weight multi-core connectors. And Shoko realized that they were very, very quickly being out of date. Uh, they were not going to be able to compete with this. this. This was not a Shoko lighting system. There was no way Shoko could have put this system together. So they realized we've either got to jump in and get on board with all this new, um, this newer, lighter weight technology, or we, know, we need to go in a totally different direction. Um, we, we need to go down another path here. So they decided, let's build a light that changes color. Um, there were many iterations. There were many, um, many different ideas were thrown at this. Um, so if, if these concepts had been around, if the idea of making a light that moves had been thought about even as early as 1928, what changed to make this possible? What changed to make it possible for companies like Shoko and later to, to start building moving light systems. Well, one of the things that changed was discharge lighting sources were developed. Um, these were initially created for slide projectors. Um, when you're using slide projectors in your home, you had little bitty light bulbs, but if you wanted to use slide projectors for larger corporate events, you need a lot brighter light source. So companies like General Electric started building um, 
replacing filament light sources with really compact, very high brightness light sources. They were very high brightness. They were, the other great thing about them is that they had a very, very tiny light source, a very nice little tiny area where the, um, where, the, where the spark jumped between the two electrodes. So you had a very small, very high brightness light source. And it was a lot easier to make that collect in, a, in an optical system. So this was a great thing. One of the negative things about these early lights especially is they were not that consistent light bulb to light bulb. I used to say you could open up 10 different lights, put 10 different brand new discharge lights in 10 different fixtures and have nine different shades of white. Um, on the other hand, in the rock and roll business, we didn't care. We just needed a really bright light source and these things were there. Um, the next thing that happened was dichroic glass, dichroic coatings on glass. Gel burned out. You had a very large, uh, an eight inch light. You had a 10 inch cut of gel. Um, if it was a deep cut of gel, like red or blue, it would burn out after one or two shows. Um, you had to keep replacing gel. If you're gonna build something uh, and you want that color to last, um, the notion of dichroic coating, a chemical coating on glass um, that passed the right color light through. The, so that technology helped. That made it possible to start to think about a light that changed color, a, a motorized light. And finally, finally you had solid state electronics. Up until the 50s and 60s, it was all done with tubes. If you wanted to do anything with electricity and do anything with electronics, you did it with tubes. Then you had transistors, and then you developed to put a multiple, uh, then you did, uh, it evolved that you could put multiple transistors in a chip and have integrated circuits. So now the George Eisenhower giant rack to, to control only one or two lights could be done in a lot smaller space. So all these things had happened technically, all these things had evolved for te from technology that made this possible. So all this stuff had happened and the folks at Shoko realized we needed to do something. So what did they do? Well, they started working on this color changing light. Um, and people in a room, in a lab went to work with this stuff. Let's take a discharge light. Uh, let's put it in front of a lens. This stuff was purchased from hobby st stores, hobby shops. Um, the stuff was ordered out of Edmund Scientific Catalog. Lenses were ordered out of catalog. So let's just, let's sort this out. Um, let's make this little light that'll change color. And, and that's how it evolved. Um, we're going to build this light that changes color. The other great thing about Shoko, as far as what happened then, is you happen to have a really interesting group of people who were there. Um, if you want to know who to blame for moving lights, you need to don't have to look much farther than this photograph. Um, these were four um, four people who I consider near and dear friends, by the way, um, who were responsible for building the first um, very light system. John Covington on the left there, he was an analog um, expert. He built power supplies, he built analog circuitry. Um, super intelligent. Next guy over there is Jim Bornhorst. Um, Jim was an ele electrical engineer, electronic engineer. He was skilled in mechanical engineering. He was skilled in optics. Um, he was truly a Renaissance guy and he provided all that work for this. And he was um, the, the team leader for this project. Uh, the next guy was Brooks Taylor. Brooks did the software design. He's responsible um, for the console, the console, the GUI, the interface. Um, and the last guy there was Tom Walsh, who was the electronics guy, the guy that designed all the printed circuits. Um, the interesting thing about Tom Walsh is that his degree was in music. He was a violin player. In terms of designing printed circuit cards, he was completely self-taught and he created the, um, all the electronics and designed all the, the printed circuit cards for all the initial very light consoles. So you happen to have in one building, um, just by sheer chance, these really interesting um, people here and an amazing collection of, of skills 
who got together in a room and said, let's build this first color changing life. Then you had a barbecue sandwich. So what's that all about? Um, as, as I said, the, the, the initial idea was to create a color changing light. Um, and we're gonna build this new little fixture. Uh, and it occurred uh, one day, we're having lunch. Um, I'm very fortunate that I was actually at this lunch. Um, we're, we're, at, we're at a barbecue restaurant in Dallas. And one of the owners of Shoko said, you know, we're gonna build this new little light and it's gonna be, and it's gonna be a completely custom fixture. Um, because we're gonna change colors, we have to build this controller for it. Uh, we're gonna have to build a, a way to change color remotely. You know, if we put two more motors on it, pan and tilt, that light will move. Would that be a good idea? Um, and of course, we looked at each other around this table and said, yeah, we think that would probably be a very nice idea. Thank you very much. So the, the final leak, um, that's one of the interesting parts of the story to me. The initial very light idea was for a color changer. Um, although people had been thinking about moving lights and panning and tilting lights for 100 years before that, um, this, this, um, the idea that the very light system would be a moving light system actually came very late in the thought process. We're gonna build a light that changes color, and oh, by the way, let's make that thing move, and that might be a good idea. This is what we call the VL0. It was the very, very first moving light prototype. Again, it was built with folded, uh, hand-folded bits of metal on a workbench, uh, lenses ordered from um, Edmund Scientific, parts ordered from hobby shop catalogs, um, solenoid remote control parts used for, um, used for uh, remote control airplanes. All that stuff went into this thing to create this, this first little light, this first panning and tilting light. The controller, I don't have a photograph of the controller, regretfully, um, but the controller was made to run one light, control two or three, store two or three cues and demo it. This is the fixture that was taken from Shoko's uh, office in Dallas to uh, Genesis in the UK um, to show them and say, hey, do you want to use this thing? Um, Genesis, by the way, was a long-term client of Shoko. Shoko had provided their lighting and sound systems since early in the 1970s. They were in fact friends of the family. So when this light uh, was created, Genesis was the first person we thought about to show it to. Um, while I'm thinking about it, one of the things to make clear is that I can take zero credit for any of this. I was just lucky enough to have been in the room. Um, so when I say we, I'm talking about Rusty Boucher, who was one of the show owners. I'm talking about Jim Bornhorst. I'm talking about all the other guys in that photograph came up with this stuff. So don't blame me for any of this stuff. I can take no credit. Um, Genesis said, yeah, we'll do that. We will invest in that. We're going we're gonna to want some of these lights for our next tour. Um, so we set about building the first 50 lights. Um, the initial production run was 55 fixtures. Um, and the initial controller um, got, re got put aside. And this was the very first controller for the very first 50 lights. Um, even though it could shrink a little bit, you still had a, a light console that was your, um, your human interface, but you had this pretty good sized card rack uh, with all these circuit cards to, um, to make all the electronics work. So this was your very first real practical moving light console. So when I say very light didn't invent the moving light, what they did do was put all this stuff together and built, in fact, the first moving light system. They took the discharge lights, they took the electronics, um, integrated circuits, they took um, dichroic glass, and they figured out a way to make all this stuff work together to make this first system. Um, I've got a console, I've got a distribution system, I've got these very first lights, um, we're gonna build a system. And so that's what Very Light did, that's why Very Light can take the credit for the creation of kind of the modern era of moving lights. 
One of the great things about this that's interesting to me is this very first console created some ideas which are still in use today. Um, the, the brilliance of these guys, the Brooks Taylors and the Tom Walsers. Um, another side note here is while I talked about each one of these guys like they had their own specialty, it was, it was great to watch them work together because they all contributed to each other. Um, the software guys were talking about electronics, the mechanical engineering guys were talking about optics and we're talking about uh, user interface with the software guys. These, these four folks were working together to make all this stuff. So it was truly a group effort. Um, but one of the great things about this console is that for the first time that I know of, and again, if any of you out there know different, I'd be glad to be corrected. It's the first time I know of that the way we think about moving lights today are multi-parameter fixtures was, um, was created. If I run moving lights off of a standard light console, channel one is my intensity, channel two is my pan, channel three is my tilt, and I have to juggle a lot of numbers to, to control all these different parameters of a moving light. This initial moving light console, this original console changed all that. A fixture was a channel number, and once I collect, selected that channel number, the pan knob moved the pan, the tilt knob moved the tilt. So this channel, this, this console, a channel wasn't an individual parameter. A channel was the entire fixture, and the console did all the work for you and put the appropriate parameter on the appropriate controller. So, and we still do that today. Um, it also was the first that I know of to to use the idea of rotary encoders as opposed to faders. A fader has an absolute value. Um, if it's in the middle, it's at 50%. If it's all the way at the top, it's at 100%. And once I connect a fixture to that fader, it's gonna jump to where the, whatever the value is of that fader. This is not gonna work with a bunch of moving lights. Um, rotary encoders, the, the great thing about rotary, the rotary encoders, encoders that got used on this is that they had relative values, not absolute values. So once I selected a fixture, the pan knob would change the pan, but relative to where it was already sitting. So I didn't have to worry about where the encoders were. I could just select a light, start turning pan, it would, and it would pan in either direction based on where it already was. Which, when you think about it, um, was the only thing that would make any of this stuff possible. There would be no way to deal with it with a bunch of faders with absolute value to do it with in any kind of system, uh, large scale system, multiple fixtures with multiple parameters. Um, and the other great thing about this original console is that there already were palettes. We're already thinking about ways to speed this up. We have a color palette. We can store uh, the colors that we want on buttons so I can get to them easily and not have to create them every single time. There were beam palettes. Very quickly after that, there were focus palettes. So the whole notion of palettes. So a lot of the ideas that we still consider today um, to be just kind of a given when you're talk, talking about uh, controlling moving lights um, were present in this very, very first console. And one final little note here about these early days. When we were talking about moving lights, we were talking about um, position changing spotlights. I want, a, I want a remote controllable spotlight. Um, if, a light, if I'm standing center stage and I walk down stage, it can be a backlight. If I'm standing center stage and I walk up stage, it can be a, a front light. If I go over to the side, it can be a side light. So that light can fade out, fade in on another position, fade out and fade in on another position and do all these great things. It was a remote control follow spot. One thing that we really didn't have an idea about and it wasn't really apparent until we built a whole lot of these things and started controlling them at once, is that these, the movement itself would be something. This wasn't just about a light that I could fade out and put in a new position and fade back in. The movement itself, um, it was never really obvious at first how important that was gonna be. And it was only when you, when you set up 50 of these lights and you put them in a room with smoke in it and start turning that tilt knob and they start panning and tilting that you realize kind of, um, whoa, <laughs> this is scary. 
the movement itself is going to be a thing. Um, and that was, uh, that's another great thing about having been there in these early days, um, is that you got to witness that change. You got to witness that, that, that realization that, oh my God, this, this, this movement is going to be something. This is going to be scary stuff. So all this happened. Genesis said, yeah, we're going to buy 50 of these lights. We're going to invest in the company and we're going to take this stuff on the road. So in 1981, this very first Genesis tour, um, hit the road. Um, and the very first Genesis show of that tour was, uh, was in a bull ring in Barcelona, Spain, uh, in September of 1981. Uh, you'll notice since it was an outdoor show, it was done with ground support, um, mostly park ends. Uh, there were 44 lights in this system. Uh, remember you're in a bull ring. A bull ring is covered in sand and dirt. Um, Bulls died the night before. The smell backstage was hideous. Um, they're, we're loading in in the morning and they're hauling out the dead carcasses of the bulls that died the night before. Um, this was an amazing um, 21st or 20th century event uh, in a bull ring, which had been <laughs> where they had done bullfighting the same way they had done it for hundreds of years. So a pretty amazing cultural thing going on here, the idea of this modern, uh, what was for them a very modern day lighting system in this, uh, in this bull ring. I should stop and ask, are there any questions? Are we getting any, um, are we getting any response from folks? Actually, Tom, we have had a couple of questions come in um, and now would be a, a great time uh, to pause. So uh, one of the first questions that came in early in the session, was uh, with some of the early Verilite fixtures storing their playback on board and being triggered from the console, what was the process of swapping in a new fixture? Did the console create a locally saved version for each fixture for that purpose? And if this is a question you're going to answer later, we can cover. We can come back to it. Um, let's wait till we get to that point. We're we're right. not quite there in history. This the the data for these lights and um, was very much akin to DMX. Um, this is before the days of DMX, or actually, and maybe in the early days of DMX. This was not DMX, but it was a very similar system. You had a, an address followed by um, eight bits of data that controlled pan, tilt, color, intensity, beam size, and all that stuff. Fantastic. Um, so this was done. Each one of those fixtures uh, listened for its address, got its information from, from the data stream, and did what it was supposed to do. Later on, we got into the idea that the information was stored, stored on the fixtures. Um, and we'll get to that here in a second. OK, we can come back to this question if we need to then. Um, a question uh, from pre, pre this particular slide. Uh, was the creation of a moving light or a color changing light, was this a passion project done after hours? Or was it directed from company leadership to, to try and go out and make a new thing? Was it the company that was leading it? Were bands asking for it? Or did this group of people from that picture you showed us earlier just decide that, you know what, we need to come up with a better way? Um, it was a passion project, but it was, it was an official company thing. Shoko basically realized they were going to go out of business as a lighting company if they didn't solve this problem. Um, I, I didn't get a lot into this. The, the very first Shoko lighting systems, one of the problems with being the first company to do anything um, is that then other people can look at what you're doing and do it better. Um, our first lighting systems were very heavy. Steel park hands, um, heavy 12 free lighting, heavy connectors. It was heavy, heavy, heavy. Um, as, as I mentioned, people after us started building lighter weight systems. Um, you could mount six aluminum park hands on one bar and you could carry two bars in each hand um, as opposed to having something that was, you could barely carry around one light. Um, so we were getting ready to go out of business if we didn't come up with a, something different. Um, and again, there, will, there was a lot of brainstorming. How do we build a better light? How do we, um, the idea of a color changer to add to existing park hands, that came up. And we never, we, we never, we never thought of scrollers or anything like that that evolved later to solve the problem that way. Um, 
And uh, out of all the brainstorming came this idea of using discharge sources and dichroic filters um, to create a brand new light. But it was definitely, um, it was a passion project. It was also a, a, a last chance, let's make this thing work so we can stay as, in business as a lighting company. Um, so so that's, how, that's how that happened. They were, um, these, these four guys very quickly um, evolved as being the, the leaders and all that and the, the, the people with the, the best set of skills to make all this work. Perfect. So that's how that happened. Thank you. Oh. Um, two, uh, two more questions and then I think we can move on. Um, lighting output for the old VLs like the VL0 you showed, how consistent was the lighting output for those? Oh, the real answer would be not very. Perfect. Okay. Um, and, and again, those original, those early discharge lights, um, lamps were not that consistent in color temperature. Some would, they would all start to age very quickly. Some would age to the brown side. Some would age to the blue side. Some would age to the green side. Um, but they were, they were not as bright. They were not what we would consider bright by today's standard. Um, for something that small, they were very bright. So they were, they were ideal to create an, an optical system around for these original lighting systems. Fantastic. Last question, and then we should move on, is uh, for that Genesis tour in 1981, who was the lighting director? The lighting director was a guy named Alan Owen. Um, Alan passed away in 1996. Um, he was an old and dear friend, a, a lovely guy, and he had been Genesis lighting designer um, since the early 1970s. Um, I was the programmer. Um, so I sat at the other console. He ran the PARs and I ran the very lights. Um, and another great thing, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but it was fun. Um, Genesis was a great band to work with on this, on this stuff. Um, after rehearsals, they would sit out at the lighting console and gather around and look at what we were doing and offer suggestions. Now, if you're a lighting awesome. designer and, 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 and a, if you're a lighting designer and the band says they want to help, that can be the kiss of death. Be, <laughs> oh my God, I don't want those people anywhere near what we're trying to do here. Um, but in the case of Genesis, it was not that way. They were smart, they were intelligent. Uh, they had great ideas. A lot of times we would get too ditzy and get too complex, and they were always kind of help, helping rein us in. Let's make this simple. Um, we don't need five colors on at once. Let's just have one color on at once or two colors on at once. Um, and they were really intelligent, and they would say, that's a really great looking cue. Let's save that for this part of this other song. So they were um, they weren't the lighting designers, but they did contribute. They were part of it. Oh, so that's fantastic. We would sit there. Alan would be at his console coming up with the ideas. I would throw in my stuff. Genesis would be there. Um, the, the members of Genesis would be there contributing. So this was good fun, and it was really an amazing collaborative process to make this stuff work. Wow, that's really cool. I'll, I'll be the collective voice of everybody, like wistfully thinking, wow, please. that's really cool. So let's get back in this. Please, yeah. Please. <laughs> he said. So, so here's a, this is a, not a great photograph because here's, here's one of the scary things. Most nights, it went really well. Um, we had some bad nights pretty early on. If you look at all those white lights across the top, they were all supposed to be on and they were all supposed to be white. Now, most of the time, it didn't look this bad. Um, but these original 50 fixtures required a lot of work. Um, every day, there were two or three things that had to be taken. The covers had to be taken off. Um, people had to go into the um, go into the fixtures, fix things, realign things, repair things, uh, readjust trim pots, and make these things work. So this was tough going in these early days. The fact that they worked at all was amazing, but a lot of times it wasn't all that great. We just did the best we could. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, now here's another thing to get into. I've, I've looked at this from obviously because of my background from a very, very light centric point of view. Um, but early on, there were moving mirror lights. Um, 
the, the companies that you know about, the Clay Package and the Coimars and the High End Systems, the Martins, um, got very, very quickly, because of the uh, very light started to make a, a, pretty, a pretty big uh, impact on the touring business, and people were looking for other ways to make this stuff move. Um, so you had all these other companies creating all these moving mirror lights. But one thing to know, if you're going to credit uh, very light with one of the very first moving light, or the very first moving light system, if you talk, want to talk about the first people to really do a practical 20th century moving mirror light, it was a company called Chameleon uh, in France. And they created a, a line of fixtures called, called Telescans. So if you credit uh, very light with the development of the first moving yoke, panning and tilting fixture, you need to credit uh, Chameleon with the development of the telescan. And this was happening almost at exactly the same time as the development of the very first moving light sy uh, system by very light. Now they didn't get a system, uh, they weren't as much of a lighting system. They built a fixture and they used other lighting consoles. Uh, they didn't build their own custom controller. So they went off in that direction. But if you want to talk about this stuff and, and, and credit where credit is due, you need to remember Chameleon and uh, a French company that were the very first that I know of uh, practical moving mirror light. Um, this is a photograph of the original VL1. Now, the very first 50 lights looked an awful lot like this, but this was actually a bit of an upgrade. In the 1982 Genesis tour, we came out with these uh, and these became the VO ones that were used throughout the 1980s. Um, panning and tilting, discharge light in the back, an upper enclosure with a power supply. Um, things got a lot slicker looking, but still the idea is still the same today. Um, this is the controller that powered that light. This was the um, what we what was called the Series 100 controller. Uh, the first controller that you saw earlier evolved into this. Again, you had a light, you had a, a console that considered a channel an entire fixture. When you selected a fixture, it all mapped to the right place. You had pallets. Um, you had um, all the, a lot of the things that we still use today to, to make it possible to control moving lights was present in this console. Um, and very quickly, you, you kind of had this battle that went on. Some people like the idea of panning and tilting moving yoke lights. Other people like the idea of moving mirror lights. Um, a lot of the fixtures that came out to compete with the original very light system were the moving mirror lights. Um, so there was a bit of a, a battle. It was sort of like beta versus VHS. Uh, which one of these is better? Who's going to win? Um, a mirror light was rapid fast. That tiny little mirror could move from stage left to stage right in an instant. So the movement was incredibly fast. Um, and you could cram an awful lot of technology in one of those canisters behind that mirror. Um, but it was a bit bulkier. It was a longer, heavier fixture. Um, and a moving mirror light could not, con could not cover the amount of stage that a, that a panning and tilting light, yoke light could. A moving Mirror light can only, can only create a cone of light, maybe a 30 or 40 degree cone. Uh, and then, and then the, the light would shine past the mirror and you didn't get any light. A moving yoke light uh, with panning and tilting, it was not nearly as fast, but it could hit the entire stage. It could go from all the way out into the audience to all the way back up on the site. And, and another thing about this, and this is kind of my own personal opinion, one of the reasons I think that moving yoke lights ended up being more successful is that the movement itself, while not as fast, was a little more organic. Um, I, I don't know how to phrase this any better except to say it was prettier. Uh, a moving yoke light looked better moving from place to place. Uh, it was more organic looking. Um, that's just my opinion. So, um, but in the meantime, as, as I said earlier, Choreography, choreographing the lights, moving the lights themselves became part of the show. Um, and I think um, my own personal opinion is that moving lights, moving yoke lights ended up being kind of the winners in all this um, because of the fact that I think they look better in the air. 
I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on this stuff. One of, one of the interesting things is that, you know, before moving lights, you didn't have to worry about the, the, the lamp itself. You knew it was going to be a, an incandescent bulb. You knew it was going to be a tungsten bulb or a tungsten halogen bulb. Uh, but moving lights introduced the notion of discharge lights. Um, and discharge lights meant that you had to start paying attention to stuff that you didn't have to use to pay attention to. Um, color temperature was different. Um, the white light was totally different. Um, you could assume that a, dis that a tungsten light would look good on skin. A discharge light, maybe not. It might have been a little too green or a little too blue. And a tungsten light looked really good until it burned out. A discharge light would get would degrade over time and get bluer or greener and be not as pretty. So things started to change and you had to start paying more attention to lamps. Um, as long as there were only tungsten lights, you didn't have to worry about color ending. They all looked great. Um, but once you had discharge light, you had to start paying attention to things like color rendering. Um, um, incandescent lights had beautiful color rendering and still do. Um, other sources of light may or may not be as good. Uh, the low pressure sodium lights um, that are used in parking lots, the color rendering index is only 18. And that's why you can't tell a red car from a brown car. So the, the introduction of discharge lights kind of changed and added this level of complexity of light sources. Um, another thing that changed is dimming. You took dimming for granted. If you gave it more power, it was brighter. If you gave it less power, it was dimmer. Uh, with a discharge source, it had to stay on all the time. So now we're having to do dimming mechanically. Uh, we're kind of returning to the days where we lowered a tin can over that candle. Um, it stays on all the time and we have to build this Venetian blind thing or this iris thing or this claw thing that's going to black the light out gradually and do our very best to come up with something that looks nearly as good as, as a, an electrical filament dimming. So this changed. We took gel for granted until we had dichroic glass. Now dichroic glass, especially early on, had, had less precise color, but it had great heat tolerance. You could put a really, really hot beam of light through that dichroic glass, something that would melt a piece of gel in an instant. The dichroic glass would, would last forever. It was expensive, but you never had to change it. So a lot of things changed with moving lights. Uh, a lot of things technically that you didn't have to used to worry about. All you had to do was keep buying more gel. Um, now we had to start thinking about this stuff. So now we get into the fun part. Um, You've got the, 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 the concert touring industry adopted moving lights very, very quickly. And it got added to the mix. You had lasers, you had moving lights, you had park hands, and rock and roll lighting designers went to town. Um, this is a Genesis drawing. But systems got bigger and bigger. Like I said, the original Genesis system was uh, 44 lights. The, we would send out 12 lights, 10 lights, 15 or 20 lights. Um, the next generation Genesis tours went out with 100 or 150 lights. So moving lights um, changed. Now, oh, to, to answer one of the previous questions, in 1985, the Series 200 came out, and that's the, uh, out of the very light shops, and that's the system where the lighting cues resided in the fixture. And all the console had to do was broadcast a Q number. Console would broadcast Q201, and each and every light had stored within itself uh, what it was supposed to do for Q201. The, the reason for that was the fact that um, if that had happened today, it wouldn't have happened that way. Um, digital, digital data streams are fast enough to keep up, but back in that time, if I want to hang 12 or 15 lights, I can do it with serial data. At that time, though, serial data didn't move that fast. If I want to control 150 lights with a serial data stream, um, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to see latency. Light number 150 is going to start moving a little bit after light number one. because it, um, So the only way to get around that was to store the queue data on in each and every fixture, so all the console had to do was to broadcast a, um, a Q number. 
And the way we the way we took care of that was we had many floppy disks, and every night after the show and after we were programming, um, we would run floppy disk, and it didn't take 10 seconds or 15 seconds. Um, you had to run four or five or six disks that took uh, 15, 20, 30 seconds each. So it might take five or 10 minutes to back up your show. If you had to swap out a light, um, then you picked out the right disk and ran the data back into that light. God forbid, if a light went down before you'd done a backup, then you had to recreate every single cue from that light. So it was not an ideal system, but it worked and it made it possible to go very quickly to these larger systems. Uh, on the one hand, it was tedious. On the other hand, you could hang 150 lights and do things that look like this. More Genesis stuff. Um, with the exception of bands like Genesis, most designers used, added um, moving lights to their to existing systems. So most lighting systems, even as today, are not all moving lights, are not all conventional lights. They used a bit of both. Um, so not too long after the, let's back up. The first moving lights were spotlights, hard edge lights, gobos, um, nice sharp edges. Not bef before too long, we realized we're going to we're going to add to the system idea. We have moving spotlights. What about moving wash lights? The first moving wash light was called a VL3. It had a tungsten halogen source and a built-in dimmer. Um, was a beautiful light, but just not bright enough to compete. The first very practical wash light was the VL4. Uh, we're talking 1988. Discharge source, really bright. Not as pretty in some ways as a VL3, um, but really bright in this wonderful, nice, soft beam. Um, it was really punchy. Great light. It also had a dowser on it, so it could do a mechanical strobe, and nothing has ever looked as good as that VL4 mechanical strobe. Really an amazing effect. Um, so here we have it. Now we have moving wash lights and moving spotlights. So lighting designers are now sorting out how to use these and get better and better with them. Um, and something that's even happening today, now we have the ability to do all the things with a beam of light that you wanted to do. Again, gobos, hard edges, soft edges. Um, this, this has continued to evolve. I guess the last kind of interesting thing that's happened in that world was the whole era of Sharpie type lights where a light was built to be, to do very, a very specific narrow beam thing. So that's one of the ways this stuff has evolved. Um, everything that I used to do with different kinds of tungsten halogen lights, now I can do it with a moving light and add all the, the, the new things that I can do with color changing and the ability to make all those changes internally and remotely. Hey, rock and roll, red, green, and blue. This is good stuff. Um, one of the things that I think happened, and this is, um, this is my own personal opinion here, uh, but I think lighting designers and the really, really good lighting designers got even better with the advent of moving lights. So you can do it the old fashioned way with red, green, and blue and super bright colors. But I think that moving lights made it possible for lighting designers to get better and do prettier things. Um, this is the cure from the 1980s. It's a, it's a Roy Bennett show. Um, some of my favorite images from this era are Roy Bennett, uh, Leroy Bennett cure images because he was just absolutely, was, is absolutely amazing putting this stuff to use. Um, now, why is this slide in here, you ask? Um, as somebody who actually uh, pursued a theater degree and had theater history and looked at theater history tech book, textbooks, um, when I started looking at these photographs and looking at rock and roll shows, it reminded me of something and it took a while to figure it out. And I started thinking about all these drawings from theater productions from the early 1900s. Um, hey, if you've had theater history, you know these names, Gordon Craig and Adolf Appiah and Robert Edmund Jones, and all of these great photographs where these, where these scenic designers were imagining these big, huge chunks of light flying through the air from angles. Um, 
And, it, it, and I realized that in, in, in one way or another, moving lights made, that, made it possible, made it a lot more practical to get those looks. So we go from 1912 to, to the 1980. We have it, it's possible now to do that, to have these great chunks of light flying through the air to change things, to, um, to create these amazing looks um, with moving lights that in a lot of ways, to me anyway, if, um, are evocative of, of the early days of, of, of theater lighting when people were really starting to think about what can we do on a stage. Here we are in 1921. And here we are, this is Pink Floyd in, in the 1980s. Um, I like these next three slides because they're just kind of indicative of what was possible with moving lights. Uh, we've got a 30 foot diameter projection screen upstage. Here we've got 30 lights mounted around the edge of that projection screen. They're wash lights, they're all focused and they're making this wonderful backlight. It's interesting, it's a backlight for the band. Uh, it's sculptural, it's scenic. It's doing all the great things that moving lights can do if you put enough haze in the air. You take that same system of lights and you turn off most of them and you refocus the few that you leave on as specials and now you've got a totally different look. You've got eight of those 30 lights being a guitar solo special. Now we turn all 30 of those lights back on again and we tilt them back into the, um, to the projection screen and we do a kaleidoscope thing. So to me, these three slides in a row, this is what moving lights are all about. I can be a special, I can be an effect, I can be a watch, I can do all that stuff. Um, 1917, just because we can. Okay. In 1987, the Los Angeles Opera, the LA Opera, um, picked David Hockney to design scenery for a production of Tristan Un Isolde. Now, if you don't know opera, Tristan is four and a half, five hours long. Um, the little thing at the bottom there, they meet, they fall in love, they die, um, is the entire plot of that opera, and it takes four and a half hours to tell it. The LA Opera decided to do it and decided to do it with all moving lights. So instead of four or 500 conventional lights, this entire opera was, writ, uh, was, was lit with 150 automated fixtures. And it was an amazing proof of concept. All these big, bold opera looks. Uh, and, and again, this wasn't about moving lights as an effect. This wasn't about haze in the air. This is about a, a refocusable, reprogrammable system. Um, what you didn't know if you were there was this, was this was a huge problem and very light, very nearly got thrown off of this thing um, at the last minute because 150 automated lights meant that there were 150 cooling fans and the noise coming from the stage was pretty loud. So there was a lot of last minute work done to create baffles, to turn lights on and off during the show to make sure there were as few lights on at any one time as necessary to make this work. Because while they were an amazing light and worked very well to light the opera, um, they were loud. And on an opera stage, they don't tolerate loud. So this was a big problem. Wonderful proof of concept, but had its issues. The other great thing about the proof of concept was that the LA Opera um, ran in repertory. There were multiple operas staged at once. Um, one night would be Tristan. The next night would be, um, this is a Verdi opera called Macbeth. Not the Shakespeare Macbeth, but a, an opera version of the same story. Um, and that opera was lit with the exact same 150 lights in the exact same place. Um, so what an amazing proof of concept. I can run a repertory uh, company and hang the same lights. And just by loading up new cues into my console, I can have a completely different show. Pretty amazing stuff. More Macbeth. So now we get to what happened after that. Now, as somebody who was fortunate enough to be around when all this stuff started, I heard what the old timers were saying. I heard these lights are just a fad. They will never work in the theater. They're only gonna be used in rock and roll. They're just in effect. This is never gonna happen again. We're just, 
these things are going to be a flash in the pan and then we're going to forget about them. But obviously that didn't happen. And moving lights pretty much moved their way through the entire lighting world. Obviously concert touring continued. Um, award shows are these days almost exclusively lit with moving lights. More award shows and even more award shows. Only because I've got all these great images. Um, large corporate events. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, big corporations would have corporate events for their people and put on these incredibly large ornate uh, uh, shows that use rock and roll style lighting and moving lights moved into that world very, very quickly. Um, opera, back into the opera. This time we'd built lights that didn't have cooling fans. So the opera grudgingly let us back in. And it was now possible to put moving lights over not just a rock and roll stage, but other theater stages. Um, this is more Cure, The Cure. The Who's Tommy on Broadway, one of the first shows um, that used a significant number of moving lights to light a Broadway show. Now that's a bit of a cheat, you might say, because The Who's Tommy is actually a rock and roll show done in a Broadway format. But hey, it was still there. Uh, there were lights used before that. Will Rogers Follies, um, Jules Fisher, Peggy Eisenhower used some moving lights on a show called Will Rogers Follies before this. But the Who's Tommy was one of the first shows that used them in a pretty large uh, in pretty large quantities. Uh, if I knew the numbers, I'd tell you, but I don't. Um, this is Sunset Boulevard. Again, this is not about moving lights as an effect. This is not about haze in the air. This is about this incredibly old school ornate scenery, ornate scenery lit with moving lights. This is Showboat. I believe this is a Richard Pilbro design. Uh, so moving lights worked their way back into the theater. They were precise enough, they were consistent enough, and finally, and most importantly, they were quiet enough that you could put 30 or 40 of them over, over a stage and, and make that work in a theatrical environment. Uh, this is Bring In The Noise, Bring In The Funk, um, a hip hop dance show done on Broadway. Again, this is Jules Fisher and Peggy Eisenhower. Um, Mamma Mia. Super Bowl halftime. That became a thing. The idea that we're going to do a Benny Rock show um, between the two halves of, an, of a football game. Um, and there were all sorts of moving lights still used to do those. Uh, other companies were building these huge um, moving lights that were the size of washing machines to, to ring the stage with, to, to, to ring the field with, to create these incredible moving light fixtures or moving light looks. Trade shows, car shows. How great is it to not have to go up on a lift and focus a bunch of car lights for a car show? Corporate events, trade shows again. Um, one thing that happened toward the end of the, um, in the 1990s is that houses of worship changed. Um, and what used to be a pulpit and a choir uh, became a pretty large complex performance space uh, in these pageants um, and these, the houses of worship, a lot of, a lot of them even today have incredibly uh, complex lighting systems and can do some amazing lighting. Um, this is a little night music. This is night. This is um, this is from the early days of, of Revolution, the, the first ETC moving light. Ken Billington used six of them on a production of a little night music uh, at Chicago Shakespeare. So again, moving lights were not just a fad, uh, and were not something that uh, the old timers could forget about. The, the the younger and hipper designers said, "Yeah, we want these things," and they started using them. And they've now kind of become ubiquitous. They're used in all parts of all parts of lighting today. Um, one little side note here: um, as somebody who was around when this all started, and somebody who was around in LED fixtures, it's funny how history repeats itself. Uh, in the early days of LED fixtures, uh, red, green, and blue lights were used on rock and roll shows, 
And the old rock and roll and the old theater folks said these things will never last. They're going to be a fad. They're not good enough. The color's not good enough. And guess what? Um, they're used in the theater all day, every day, and only getting better. So I have just about talked myself out here, he said. And I would love for Matt Stoner to jump in. And David, you can jump in with any questions. Um, and let's use whatever time we have left wisely. Sounds like a plan. Matt, why don't you uh, talk about what you'd like to talk about? Because I think that might generate some additional questions. And then uh, I got a couple of questions that have come up about uh, history and stuff that we can go through. Sure. Well, um, as, uh, I was, uh, as I um, introduced myself in the beginning, I'm the product manager for automated lighting at Hind Systems and ETC. And um, it's really interesting listening to Tom talk because there's so many parallels between the way that automated lighting started and how it continues to grow. Um, you know, he, he talked about how uh, there was a perfect storm of technology in the 1970s that allowed moving lights to start existing. And it seems that in our current world, uh, it is the perfect storm of technologies that continue to make lights grow uh, and give us new options yeah. and new products to, um, to shop for and, and look at. Um, you know, we've seen some really big technological updates or improvements in the past couple of years in modern automated lighting. Um, things like LED engines have become a huge change. Um, you know, there was a time probably 10 years ago, five, five to 10 years ago, where people said, oh, you know, moving lights that are LED, that's, that's not going to happen for a long time. Uh, you know, we're never going to have a, a moving light, an LED moving light that's brighter than an arc source. Well, I think one of the things that we've seen since then is that uh, with high-end high -end systems as a pioneer in the white light LED sector, um, that, that has started to fall away and many moving lights are managing to use LED sources to be brighter than their arc source compa compatriots. Um, you know, along with those LED engines come a lot of great benefits like better consistency between fixtures. Uh, you know, Tom was talking early on about how the consistency was a really big challenge. And I think that's something that we, we've seen a lot of improvement as we've moved to LED and also longer life. Um, LED lamps are well known for their long, their long light lives. I mean, we see a lot of lamps that are, or LEDs that are 20,000 to 50,000 hour lifetimes. Um, I think it's some of the other big changes in modern automation, automated lighting are um, the widespread proliferation of robotics. You know, it's not just automated lighting that uses robotics in the world anymore. It's, uh, you know, factories, uh, people are building robots in their houses, CNC, um, CNC routers and 3D printers are very prevalent all over the world now. And all those kinds of technologies and stuff like that do help contribute to products that we make and, and the systems that we move forward with. Um, there's also a lot a lot more opportunities for different manufacturers and specialty products. You know, uh, early on when Verilite and High End Systems and Clay Packy uh, and all those companies first started out, and, and Martin as well, um, it was a, a limited group of products. And, and now to those companies, we've also added many, many new companies out there. So uh, that gives us a lot of opportunities to have um, obviously a lot of competition, but with competition comes a lot of uh, speciality uh, specialty products and also concentration on the details, um, which is one of the things that we pride ourselves on uh, when we make moving lights. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to talk about modern lighting a, a whole lot, and we can just start getting to questions with Tom, but I was trying to give him a little time to take a breather. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I, think it, I think it's just interesting to look at the history of how we got to where we are and see that we are still currently evolving. Um, things are are changing day by day, and and uh, it's it's a really exciting time to be working with automated lighting. So can we get to some of the questions, please, David? Absolutely. Can... Yeah. No, I'm 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 here. Um, so we have a couple of of things that have come in. Um, one of the questions that came in was, and I think this is kind of for both of you guys. Um, not only into the past, but into the 
uh, the present, which was in regards to noise um, and, and noise generated by the fixtures. Um, has it, has, have we found it to be a problem? What have we looked at in terms of ways to resolve it? Um, our, our, our question came in specifically from someone who's in Sweden who said that it's a very large issue for them. Um, sure. What are your guys' thoughts on noise? John, um, sorry, I'll, let, me, let me leap in that and then I'll, I'll it, it, it is a problem. It is difficult to build a light that is bright um, and does everything you want it to do without cooling. To, to put it, um, to keep an LED array cool enough to operate, uh, to keep all the motors and all the stuff inside that tin can um, cool enough to operate, generally requires cooling fans. I, 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 the fans have gotten better. The hardware itself has gotten where it is more tolerant of heat. Um, the different things have happened to make it better, but it is still difficult, but not impossible to, to create a light which, which, which has zero noise. Um, one thing that has happened, and I, I think most people don't want to think about this, um, but audiences have gotten used to more noise. Mechanized scenery, um, amp racks, everything on a stage, or in and around a theater stage these days, generally has a fan in it. Um, and I believe audiences have gotten more tolerant of kind of an ambient background noise level. Um, so the fixtures have gotten quieter. And I think the audiences themselves have gotten a little bit more tolerant of, of, of noise levels. Um, mm -hmm. on, on the other hand, there are situations like concert halls uh, and performing art spaces uh, through orchestra halls where that's not true. It has to be perfectly quiet. Um, and we're now moving into an era where it is possible to build lights, which can be um, absolutely quiet, zero, zero noise. And I'll let Matt jump in here and talk about that. Sure. You know, noise is, is a very interesting topic to us because as I was just talking about specialty products, um, that's, that's one of the things that we've concentrated on as a specialty product in the past. Um, you know, some of you guys may be familiar with the High End System Studio Color, which was a, a great product of, of our of High End Systems past, um, which was designed to be a fanless uh, moving light, uh, one of the few at, at that time that were available. Um, and and we've, we strive to continue that specialty, um, to have that specialty with products when we can. Now, shameless plug, obviously this is a High End Systems ETC presentation, so I'm, I'm going to talk about some products a little bit. We have developed... Um, over the past uh, a, a few fixtures that we believe are the quietest in the industry, including the solar frame feeder, which is a fanless fixture that uses all convection cooling. Now it is a little bit heavy because it all is all um, convection cooled. It needs a little bit extra aluminum in it for that, um, for that heat sink. But, um, you know, we have looked at that need and tried to work on it. Um, you know, I think, I think the person who asked that question was from Sweden and they were saying, you know, it seems that some regions have problems there and some don't. And I think that's very true as well. There's certain regions of the world that um, are very sensitive to noise. There's certain types of venues that are very sensitive to noise. Um, and not all venues are obviously a big long loud rock concert doesn't really care that much. But uh, it is important to us and we, and we have been working on products and, and have released products that do address noise concerns um, in a very creative and unique way, so. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, just looking through some of these other things. A couple of, of Shoco slash Verilite questions. Um, was Verilite originally part of Shoco or was it always a separate company? No, Verilite was a Shoco product in the early days. Um, it was the Verilite system that was offered to you by Shoco that you could rent or lease from Shoco for your tours. Um, and then in the sort of the middle end of the 1980s, it it split off as a separate company um, with with common ownership, uh, but it, but it became a separate company. So uh, Choco and Verilight were two separate companies in the same building, same board of directors, but two separate companies. Fair enough. Um, we're 
the folks at Shoko slash Verilite aware of the Eisenhower fixtures at the time of development? Oh yeah. Um, was it was it parallel? Was there a, was there a patent concern when when they went forward, or were they able to to grab that fixture, an open source design? They were aware of that. They had, I, I, I believe, and I'm not 100% sure that I'm correct, but I believe that 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 Rusty Boucher, one of the owners of Shoko, actually met with George Eisenhower to talk about this. So there was um, there was definitely knowledge of what went on before us. Oh man, um, to be a fly on the wall in that room. The whole that I don't even want to start the whole issue of patents. Yeah, no, we had a couple of questions that came in on that, <laughs> and, and, I, and, uh, I, and, I, and I just said no. Uh, that's I'm, that's I'm, a bar and, conversation, and not a not a I, webinar conversation. I, I do that because I know a little, but not enough to actually make any kind of authoritative statements. Um, I was out on the road running this stuff. I was not in the offices where they were dealing with the patent stuff. So I'm gonna I'm gonna respectfully decline to get into the whole notion of patents. Um, yeah, not not today and not while we're being recorded, that's it for is, sure. It is, however, a very interesting topic, the whole notion of intellectual property uh, and the notion of intellectual property for creative people. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do I protect my ideas? Um, and, you know, there are people who say, well, we're the theater and we're, we're artists and we should all give each other all of our ideas. And that all sounds great, but we all have to eat, we all have to earn a living, we all have to do it. Um, so the notion of, of intellectual property and protecting your ideas so that you can benefit from them um, it is an important thing and a whole other topic. So I'm going to stop before I get started. Fair enough. I'm going to help you switch topics. Um, <laughs> when you were touring and Moving Lights started to come into fashion, what did you find in terms of the switch that was required for power needs for a lighting rig? Well, they got less and less. I mean, a, a Mark 350 was 350 watts, um, and it would do what you might hang four or five 1,000 watt bars. So that was that was another. You know, I talked about how in, in the days of Van Halen hanging a thousand par cans, that was 1,000 1,000 watt par cans. Um, so you had, you know, your your backstage power needs um, were huge. And moving lights helped that. You didn't have to hang as many fixtures, and each of the fixtures did not draw that much power. So they were that that was part of what made it possible for shows to get bigger and more impressive was the fact that that the fixtures themselves did not draw as much power. So it was a, it was very much a benefit um, in in the constant quest for a larger, more impressive, more exciting show. To put, a, to put around a rock and roll performer. Um, moving lights made it possible to continue doing more stuff. That's really cool. Um, I think this is a question for both of you. Um, when slash what changed in moving light development and in, in technology that made it more economically viable for more companies and bands and productions to be able to start manufacturing and utilizing these fixtures? In your opinion, what 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 do you think, or when do you think things changed that suddenly this went from being a very a fairly niche product to being a, a you saw it everywhere product? Well, boy, that's a giant question. That's a, that that and that could get us back into the um, um, into into the patent thing. So I don't want to get too far into that. But here's here's what I will say to tab dance around that question. Um, very light came up with some great ideas. They created some patents around those ideas. Uh, there were other companies who were competing with Very Light who wanted to get in on it. Um, and, and this was a good thing. Now at the time when you're being competed against, you don't think it's a good thing. But for the end user, this is a great thing. If you have multiple companies and each one is trying to be better than the other one, and each one is trying to compete with the other company, um, both on a financial and, and product level, a better product at a good price, um, that's a good thing for the end user. Um, so th the fact that there were more companies um, building stuff 
I do things a certain way, I get a patent on it, and my competitor says, I want to do something, and I want to do that, but I can't do it the same way, so I have to, um, I have to go to work. I have to create a new way of doing that. I have to um, um, come up with a great new way of doing that. So the, the, the winner there is the end user. Mm-hmm. Um, he gets things to choose from. He gets two people competing against each other for price. Um, so that's how things got more and more used. More and more companies started doing it. Um, yeah, I remember in the in the mid '90s when I was working for uh, uh, a lighting dealership that it was just there was a, a ton of different companies that were putting out product, and none of them were me too. Right? Everybody had everybody had something that was specific to their product line that made it interesting and viable. So there. <laughs> yeah, and I think what we see what we see um, currently and into the future is. Uh, the the maturation of this type of technology, right? Uh, you know, this technology has been around for almost what you started talking about the 70s. So 50 years, moving lights have been around. Um, so that's, you know, robotic technology has gotten better and more affordable in that time. Um, electronics have gotten better and more affordable in that time. And all of those things combined help to make, um, you know, make competition better and make, uh, the market stronger. That's why people, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All, all, all part of it. Jack asks us: uh, Do you feel lighting consoles expanded capabilities to match moving light capabilities, or vice versa? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, like I said, one of the one of the things that Very Light did was they looked at the notion of moving lights as a system. I'm going to build a light that pans and tilts and changes color and changes beam size and, and has intensity control. Um, and in order to do that well, I can't just pick an old console and, and try to scab that together and make it work. I have to create a console that was purpose built to do that. Um, so at, absolutely, the consoles um, changed. And, and, you know, a lot of the back and forth, you had the console designers and developers, and then you have the end users. You have the lighting designers. You have the programmers um, who, as you well know, are not shy about saying this doesn't work well. Um, you need to change the way that console works. You need to give me a new button that does this. You need to give me a new feature that does that. So the, the desires of the, the, and needs of the designers and programmers very much drove and still drive the console manufacturers uh, to create um, lighting consoles that do exactly what they want them to do. And consequently, they get better and better every day. Agreed. No, I agree. Um, Ashley Lee would like you to either confirm or <laughs> deny a rumor that she now, heard. Now I'm scared. Now no, I'm no, scared. no. Um, Let's go. The, 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 this is one, as soon as I saw the question, I'm like, I totally know where this is going, but I'd like to see what, what your answer is. Um, Ashley says, I remember reading um, in a book that stagehands were initially afraid that their jobs might be at risk when moving lights started rolling out and would try to sabotage early moving fixtures by, by making them perform poorly. Uh, do you have any thoughts on those days? And can you confirm or deny that rumor that there was there was threat and sabotage involved? Um, as far as I know, I know I was never aware of any actual sabotage. I will tell you like everything else, it's a generational thing. Um, the older designers said these things will never work. They're a fad, they're, they're bad color. I will never use these. The younger, hipper designers jump in and say, I'm gonna figure out a way to make these work because they're great. The stagehands, essentially, you would go into a, 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 a different city for the first time with a very light system. You could see the generations. You could see the older, the older guys, and I'll say guys uh, because at that time they were all guys. Um, the older geezers would say, oh, these things are crappy and they're going to steal my job and um, they're a remote control file spot. And the younger, hipper stagehands, they would be gathered around. Show me these things. These things are awesome. How do I make, you know, how do I learn how to work on them? I want to, 
you know, I'm a stagehand. I need to know about this stuff. This is going to be moving into my world here. Here it is already. So I need to know that. Um, so to answer your question, I am not aware, me personally, of any actual sabotage. I was aware that there were some of the, again, the more kind of geezerly types who would um, who would say, I don't want to deal with these things. Um, but those days didn't last very long. And as stagehands, um, you know, the, state, the younger, hipper stagehands, you know, the, the rock and roll crews got, got older and the stagehands got younger and, and it all kind of moved together. And it was, a, 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 I have to say, a relatively cooperative world. Okay. okay, I've been told to ask this question because it will make you laugh. Um, do you think the encoders are on the wrong side of the EOS? Yes, I do. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Fair enough. All right. I was told to ask you that because it would make you laugh. Um, <laughs> yes, I am laughing on the inside. Um, oh, here's a really good question. Uh, this is, I guess, for everybody. Um, in your opinions, what was the single biggest change that moved the field of moving lights forward um, more than any of the, anything else? I don't know that you can make it that easy. I mean, to repeat myself, the, the thing that made it possible at all was just the, the development of several different technologies that made it possible to make a practical system. The ideas were always there. In 1928, this guy wanted to build a moving light, but you couldn't make a practical system. You could build one on a workbench that may or may not work, but I couldn't build 50 of them that hung in the air over a stage and, and control them and queue up a show. Um, when all that technology came together, then it became possible to do that. Um, when, when you thought about LED fixtures as red, green, and blue, um, and not a lot of color consistency, you know, you couldn't put lights over a theater stage and make it work, but the technology improved. So I don't know if there's any one thing. Sure. That, that Matt, I do you have any of. thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I don't, I think that one of the things that's really helped move the industry along is the improving of um, light sources and light engines over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of these fixtures out there were born from a really great lamp. And that was the technology that kind of always moved, has always moved things forward. Um, but, you know, with that said, even, even back uh, when Tom was doing the Genesis tour, the, the lamps he was using were suitable for, for what they were doing at the time. You know, I think one of the things that happens a lot is that we release a product and we get a lot of feedback from folks about how they like it and what they wish was different. And, and then we go back to work and try and fix those things. And then there's a next generation that keeps making it, making it better and better. So um, sure. I, I think just as much as anything, it's always striving to uh, do better by our customers. You know, some, someone, it was talking about noise before. Uh, even though we have fixtures that are very quiet, we know we can continue to work on making things that are quieter. Even though we know we have fixtures that are very bright, we know we can always work on making them brighter. So there's a lot of drive to, to make things better and better until they're the right product for you. I think that's fair. Can can I weigh in with a, with a thought on this answer? Please sure. Do. Uh, my, my thought is... Um, is I think the single biggest thing that moved them forward into becoming what they were into becoming more widely accepted was when manufacturers stopped using proprietary protocols and allowed them to be communicate to communicate via DMX. Um, that I found at least when I because I, I started I started working with moving lights in the 90s. And that was what I found made them the, the easiest to start bringing into more and more and more productions was I could just add them to infrastructure without having to bring in a secondary controller or another operator. And that's a, that's a very valid statement. You're, you are correct. It's just my opinion. Um, I'm old, not, you know, and, and sometimes know stuff, but that would, that would just my opinion on it. Hmm. Uh, what else do we have in here? Um, there's some troublemaker questions that I'm going to let Matt take a look at and see if he wants to cover any of those. Um, in the meantime, um, when did moving head projectors come out and what role do you think they have in the future of moving lights? 
Well, 1981, um, which was there. When you say moving head projectors, I'm assuming you mean panning and tilting um, fixtures with a yoke as opposed to fixtures with a mirror. Um, 1981, and absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think they will continue to be the primary type of automated fixtures. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, the, the, the fact that I think the movement in the air looks better and they can, can, can cover more of a stage. As moving lights continue to move towards LED, do you think that traditional uh, lamps and gel will fade out completely? I'm sorry, what was the question again? Uh, with the with, with the addition, uh, sorry, let me get it back where I'm looking directly at it. Um, with with the growth of LED fixtures or LED sources, do you feel that lamp and gel will fade out completely and will be moving to all LED? Well, I think that there will forever be some um, some attraction to some of the characteristics of um, uh, non LED sources. Uh, I know that there's a, a big, a big, um, a lot of pressure in in some countries to save tungsten. Uh, so you know that's going to stick around for a while. There are LED sources that do a, a really good job of emulating tungsten. Um, we have a couple of them at ETC. Um, but you know there's some people that will always have that um, visceral connection to to lamps and gel. So I don't, you know, I don't think that. We, we're going to ever force them to go out. I think that world governments may push them to go out and um, maybe maybe just feasibility and, and simplicity may eventually cause them to be replaced. But um, I, I, don't, I don't think that there's any desire for us to, to get rid of them. But, you know, just over time, I think they'll fade away just like uh, landline corded phones are going to fade away at some point. I think that's fair. I think that's completely fair. Uh, a clarification on the moving head projector. Um, not talking about moving mirror fixtures, but actual uh, where the, the light source is a projector as opposed to just an incandescent or an LED light source. I know um, this, this is more like some of the high-end fixtures that are out yeah, there. Um, this is where I really wish that, that we had brought along some of our colleagues at High-End Systems to speak on this. Um, you know, we have folks there that were the engineers that, uh, that worked on those products and product managed those products, and they have a lot of things to say about those products. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have that history to, to really speak to those right now. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Uh, I know we're a bit over time, gentlemen. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, you guys need to tell me how many more you want to see uh, before we uh, we wrap it up. About three. About three more questions? OK. Um, here's a question for the two of you, uh, which I think is a good one, which is, how do you find new technologies and go about integrating them into new lines? Um, and what is it like to take a fixture or a feature from idea to inception? Well, that's a pretty tough one. You know, what we try to do is we try to um, listen to our uh, users as much as possible and find out the things that they're looking for and what and what they're doing with lights um, more than what they're necessarily always saying you know there's a joke that we always throw around in uh in product management that uh you know if henry ford had asked everybody what they needed they would have said a faster horse um and why while, while that's really funny uh the purpose of it is that it's to say that um some sometimes you need to take the technology look at the technology and figure out where where you need to go with it um so you know just looking at the existing technologies and trying to figure out how they can actually solve problems instead of just figuring out how we can iterate. You know, everybody always wants something that's brighter and quieter and smaller and cheaper, and those things are all, all, all always true. Um, we need to figure out how we can um, solve the problems that that you guys have and 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 make those improvements as is necessary. Cool. I like that answer, Tom. Anything you want to add to that? I think we've lost Tom. Yeah, he's, it looks like he's disconnected. 
I guess I would say one other thing is you asked about what it's like being in development and developing these things. Um, it, it's very challenging because, you know, it, it's really easy for anyone to write down the perfect, perfect moving light uh, and exactly what it would do. Um, what, what comes in as the challenge is the other side of it. How do you make that happen? How do you make that affordable? How do you make that uh, work properly? Um, how do you cover all of the little intricacies and details that um, are necessary to, to be covered for, uh, for customers to be happy? So but that's where the challenge of product management lies, making those right decisions and, and making sure that um, the product that you produce uh, solves the needs of the customers that you made it for. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Um, one, I was going to ask Tom because um, somebody had asked him about what the difficulties were when he toured with the Beatles, um, but he's not here, so I'm not going to ask him that question. Um, I'll just say it out loud so that everybody can laugh. Probably um, screaming fans. Sorry. Probably screaming fans were one of the biggest difficulties. Yeah, is that what you found? Well, I don't know. I wasn't there, but... Fair. No, I completely understand. Um, I'm just looking to see if we've got one last good one to throw out. Um, and, and I think, that, Matt, this is a perfect question for you, uh, which is, what's, what do you see as next? What, 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 what would you want to share about the future of Moving Lights, since we've been talking about the history of Moving Lights? Sure. So, um, the, you know, the future of Moving Lights is, is a very interesting topic. You know, as um, technologies keep growing and, and becoming more mature, like LED technology, uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, improvement over time there. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people, especially at ETC, that are um, very interested in the value of uh, additive color mixing systems. Uh, you know, we've prov proven at ETC with our our, our Luster series and with our FOSS4 um, series of products that um, additive color mixing systems can be very attractive. So that's uh, something that that is um, that I think we'll probably see more of in the future. Um, and then also just more uh, perfection of the details and working on those um, those individual um, those individual things that help to make a uh, to make the user fall in love with the light. You know, sometimes it's really interesting. Sometimes we'll, we'll go to a shootout, we'll compare lights against other lights and we'll compare against something that's 10 or 15 years old or even older than that. And we'll go in there and it'll be something that we always thought was one of the worst things about that light that somebody says is their favorite thing about it. And, hmm. uh, and so, you know, it, it's really interesting. Uh, and it's also a challenge for us to figure out how we can take these modern technologies and, and all these great new modern lights that we have access to and really get down to the basics of what people are looking for and um, what they need and, and what they're, uh, the, the art that they're trying to make with them. Because in the end, all these moving lights are just tools that are meant to help you with your, your art, artistic expression, right? Right, um, yeah. That's what our goal is, is to help you with your artistic expression. I'm back. Hey, we missed you. Um, yeah, no, I know. I lost internet connection, so I dropped out completely there. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, the, the last question that I think we had um, that, that had come in, and I'll give you the last word um, since I was just about to wrap up the session, but uh, could you speak to the difficulties of the first Beatles tour and the rise of the touring industry? Um, I was not there for that, so I cannot speak to that at all. Ah, oh, fair. <laughs> it was funnier to ask when you weren't in the room, honestly. Um, well, cool. Tom, did you have any last words, anything last that you wanted to share? I know we are way over um, time on this session, but it seems like it's been pretty popular and we still have most of our attendees waiting to listen in on every word. So, Well, uh, I, I just appreciate that people um, stuck around for it. It was fun to do. Um, um, it's awkward to do it and not look at faces. Um, and just speak into my computer screen, but I'm glad people showed up, and I'm glad everyone listened. Um, and and I, I I thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you all. Um, you know, one of the things I came out from looking at this session is uh, I'm going to go back and talk to the rest of our team about maybe doing some additional history sessions. Um, I think we've got uh, access to a lot of history right now about different different types of products, and I think we'd like I think people might be interested in seeing some of those. Um, 
Matt, Tom, I want to thank you guys for your time today, um, especially so much of your time today. Um, I know we're all trying to do as much as we possibly can with the small amount of time that we have. Uh, for our audience, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we will be posting a recorded version of this session up so you can feel free to share it with your friends. Um, and do feel free to come back into any of the study hall events that we're going to be offering. The schedule gets posted every week and uh, we're going to be continuing to offer more and more sessions for uh, as long as we can and as long as we need to. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you to everybody. Stay safe and stay healthy.